I want to welcome Alex to the stage to talk about the tax taxonomy of circuit languages. Please take it away. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks, Anna. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a PhD student at Stanford. I've been working at, on circuit languages for a while from an academic perspective. And so I'm very excited to be here today to talk um, about sort of the whole, the whole rich zoo of circuit languages that exist. So let's, let's get into it. Um, but before I do, I want to give a, a brief word of warning, um, which is that I talk about a lot of languages and a lot of features of them, and, and I do my best to, to get everything right. Um, but if I've mischaracterized your language, um, it's it's ignorance, not malice, um, and I, I would love to know about it. So, so just send me a note or or, or correct it during um, your own your own time slot. Um, so let's get into it. So so what are circuit languages? Well, let, let's start by just thinking about the core problem that they're trying to solve. So so this is this is what's going on. We have some idea. Um, maybe it's an idea for a payment system. Maybe it's an idea for a voting application, and we think that proofs. Uh, zero knowledge proofs might be useful uh, to help us implement that idea. Um, but if you want to use a zero knowledge proof, then you need to take your, the relevant part of your idea, the thing that you're trying to prove, and you need to express it as a circuit. Um, and, and then after that, you can use the proof system to actually create a proof. Um, and so this process of going from idea to circuit, I view that as, as what circuit languages are responsible for. And that's what we're, we're talking about today. And it's, it's a challenging problem. Um, and it's not exactly clear, you know, because there are all kinds of different ways of, of writing down ideas, how exactly you'd go about this. Um, so there, there's a lot of variety. And in, in particular, over the, the past uh, eight years or so, there's been a real Cambrian explosion in the number of circuit languages and, and their types and their features and, and what they support. Um, visualizing that as a timeline um, I have up here a few of the different systems and languages that, that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and, and so this starts back up back in 2013 with very academic projects like Pinocchio, which probably most people here haven't even heard of. Um, and, and it goes up to, to changes and developments that have been happening in the past few months. Um, so to, to make sense of sort of this extremely rich timeline, I think it's useful to start trying to slice and dice these different languages based off of properties that they have. Um, and one of the most important properties for any particular circuit language is what kind of circuit it's trying to produce. And this is relevant because different kinds of circuits are used for different proof systems. Um, so broadly speaking, the languages that I've shown on, on the previous slide target one of three different uh, circuits. They target a circuit kind called R1CS, um, which you can think of as a sort of a big uh, single monolithic circuit um, where, where multiplication has some cost and addition is free. They might target Planck, which is which is quite similar, um, except for it also allows for custom gates, custom uh, yeah, custom gates in the circuit and, and verify randomness. Um, or um, they might be targeting air, which is the, the circuit representation used by Stark, which is like not even really a circuit. It's supposed to be sort of like RAM, random access machine like, um, and, and it has sort of a different cost model. So this is this is sort of the first thing that, that you should wonder about any particular circuit language. Um, and from this perspective, most circuit languages actually target R1CS. Um, so this has been this is this is because R1CS, at least historically, um, has been the circuit that the fastest proof systems are implemented for. Um, and as things like Planck um, and uh, Starks and Air have become more popular, um, there's been some need for languages targeting um, those kinds of circuits as well. Uh, so, there's a, so there's a lot of much variety here. Um, another important axis is, is the type of language. Um, so broadly speaking, I think circuit languages fall into one of three categories. The first category is, is that they're not even really languages per se, um, but they're libraries written inside some other host language that help you build circuits. Um, so you can imagine building the circuit by, by uh, issuing a whole bunch of API calls, like adding wires to the circuits, adding gates to your circuit. Um, so that's, that's what a library is, and, and some, um, some circuit languages are really more of libraries. Another option is to is to have what's called a hardware description language. So this is um, this would be a language for building circuits, uh, which 
um, is, is sort of describing the layout of the circuit explicitly as in building wires and connecting, sorry, building gates and connecting them with wires, but now not doing it through a library, doing it through a dedicated language. And, and sort of the final option is to have a real programming language where you have things like functions and you have things like variables, ideas that don't really have a place inside the circuit itself. Um, and uh, the idea is that the circuit language takes this programming language input and turns it into a circuit on the back end. Um, so you can imagine writing code in a language like this would sort of be like writing code in Rust instead of Verilog. Um, and so here is sort of an interesting, an, an interesting taxonomy because historically we started with libraries and then sort of moved to HDLs and, and have moved even further um, towards programming languages as time has gone on. And I think that what's going on here is that what we'd all love to have is, is a nice programming language that we can use um, to program zero knowledge proofs. Um, and there's just sort of a substantial challenge in actually getting there. Um, and that's why, as time has gone on, we've been able to do that more and more successfully. And, and many of the newest projects on this slide are all on the right-hand side. They're trying to expose a programming language interface to zero knowledge. Um, so once we start thinking about programming languages for zero knowledge, um, it's useful to think about the different features that we associate with programming languages and ask whether um, these different projects have been able to provide those features. Um, so one feature is mutable variables. So here I have a function that's computing a sum using an intermediate mutable accumulator. Um, and you know there are other ways to write sum, of course, but sometimes mutable accumulators are, are really what you're looking for. Um, and, and so the critical thing here is that you have this value that changes. And that's something that, that you can't directly manifest in a circuit because circuits are, are state free. They're just a bunch of wires. Um, we're not talking about digital circuits with clocks. We're talking about uh, sort of compute once circuits. Um, and so mutable variables are, are a challenging thing to implement inside a circuit language. Um, and there's some variety in terms of whether or not languages support them. Um, so a lot of the older projects don't. Um, but if you look at something like Leo or Zinc or Cairo or Noir or Zacharyt or Pekin, these um, are all, all, all systems that have some notion of, of mutable state that the user can interact with. And then, of course, behind the scenes that that mutable state um, somehow gets eliminated or replaced with an equivalent uh, chunk of circuit. Another feature is, is, is sort of the, the range of primitive types supported. So if I'm writing some, some code in Rust, then I have access to all kinds of exciting primitive types. I have access to Booleans. I have access to machine integers, fixed width integers like U32s. I also have access to IEEE floating point numbers like F64s or F32s. Um, and you, you, know, you might wonder, hey, what do I have access to uh, in some of these programming languages that target zero knowledge? Um, well, th there's a variety. Um, so for some of the more basic systems, all you have access to is, is actually a sort of a new type that's not present in Rust, which is the type of the underlying finite field that the zero knowledge proof is done over. So, so languages like CIRCOM and Cairo, um, to the best of my understanding, they, they just give you this, right? You have fields. Um, but um, there are some languages that give you a little bit more. Um, so Booleans aren't too hard to do yourself, but, but there are various systems that arguably handle it for you. These are the various um, sort of like macro assemblers and circuit libraries that have gadgets that wrap Booleans. Um, and then some of the, the newer, more high level languages also give you machine integers, fixed width integers that have uh, overflow semantics um, and, and, and things like that. What about another feature, not related to the types themselves, but related to how we, how we manipulate them and how we do control flow? One challenging, um, one challenging thing to capture in a circuit language is if statements. Um, so an if statement in a programming language is, a, is what we call a conditional branch. Um, so it's a test based on some condition. And if the test passes, then some code, some block of code runs that otherwise wouldn't run. So here we have sort of a very simple implementation of power that, that just raises some base to the power of a Boolean. So this is the power that are, um, oh, actually this, is, this, this function actually doesn't make sense now that I look at it. But inside this if statement, what we do is we have, uh, we have a condition that will um, square base if the if statement goes off. Um, and so this is an example of a conditional branch where inside the branch, there are some instructions that get issued that have side effects that affect mutable state. Um, this is something that's very challenging to support inside um, circuit languages, but also something that programmers are very used to using. Um, and so by and large, um, circuit languages don't support it. Um, th there are some that do. So, so Pekin, which is, which is an old academic project did, and, and most recently Leo supports this as well. Um, and um, Cairo, which is the language that targets air and, and, 
and thereby target Starks also supports this um, kind of kind of by design because Starks make it make it easier to support. Um, so this is yeah. So if statements are, are one area where there's this common programming language feature that um, many many circuit languages haven't implemented yet. Another thing that we're used to using in, in high-level programming languages is user-defined structures. Um, so here I have um, a representation of a, uh, a compressed uh, elliptic curve point, so an x-coordinate, and then something that tells us whether or not the y-coordinate is negative. Um, so this is an example of a user-defined structure, um, and, and one might wonder whether or not circuit languages have this, and, and the answer varies. Um, so there are some circuit languages that don't really have any user-defined structures at all. So these are um, systems like CIRCOM that are that are HDLs, um, Cairo, which is which is sort of uh, self, a self-claimed low-level language, with, um, so, so they don't have this. Um, and then um, also Noir, um, which is a new language that has, hasn't implemented this yet. Um, there's also classes of circuit languages that sort of don't need user-defined structures because they're embedded in some host languages. So this is these are the uh, the circuit libraries per se, uh, things like Bellman, Gadget Libs, and Arcee UPA, and, and in some sense they get a whole system of user-defined structures from the host language, and so it's not as important for them to actually implement it inside the circuit. Um, uh, on the other hand, end of the spectrum, um, there are some some languages that have just implemented this. So Socrates and Zinc and Bikin, they they all had user defined structures, um, and Leo had had tuples, um, which was sort of the next the next best thing. So I can't uh, create a structure where all the different fields have special names, but I, but I can create a structure um, where all the fields have numbers. This is actually not a very hard feature to implement, but I think it's just not necessarily been um, high on the priority list for for some projects. Another feature, um, one that we're used to in programming languages, is the idea of an array. So um, a chunk of elements that can be accessed at a data-dependent location. Um, and so here we have an example of that. So we have some array that's accessed at location i, and, and you know we get the value out, and we double it, and we put it back in the same location. Um, and, and the nice thing about writing the, uh, about looking at this program is that it's, it gives us examples of both variable indexed reads and also variable indexed writes. So on line two, we're reading from this unknown location, and on line three, we're writing to that location. Um, and these kinds of arrays are, are actually very challenging for circuit languages to support, because obviously circuits don't have arrays in them. Um, and so there's, there's sort of a variety of approaches here. So, so there are many um, many systems that just don't don't handle this. There's, there's no notion of array, uh, at least no notion of sort of a variable indexed writable memory. Um, so Bellman, Gadgetlib, and, and I believe UPA are all all in this class. Um, there are, on the other hand, um, there are many languages that look at this problem and say, okay, well, variable index um, arrays are really challenging. Maybe we can do something um, something simpler. Maybe we can just support constant indexed arrays. So arrays where you only ever access them at um, constant locations. Um, so this sort of turns the array into some kind of like structure or tuple or something like that. I um, mean, there are various languages that support this. So CIRCOM has this thing, has, has this noir and, and Leo all do. Um, when it comes to supporting arrays themselves, the challenge is that it's not really clear how to implement them in a circuit. One sort of naive approach um, that, that actually in, in many situations is just the best that you can do is to implement them by what we call linear scans. So you have the array be a, you know, a big list of values, and when you want to get the ith element, you just sort of go down the list of values and you ask, are you the ith element? Are you the ith element? Are you the ith element? And, and then ultimately you get the ith element, and, and you do a similar, things for, a similar thing for writing to it. Um, and this is the approach that the Socrates language takes. Um, so they, they implement this linear scans approach. Um, and, and then beyond that, there are things that you can do that are better. Um, so so Pekin, um, which is this academic project, um, implements a sort of complex memory checking algorithm that prov that provides sort of better than the linear cost of, of doing a linear scan. Um, and then Cairo, because it targets Starks, has sort of built-in support for, for large arrays in the form of the Starks memory. Um, and, and so it, it can also do something a little bit better. Okay, so that's been like a lot of information really fast. I'm sorry, the, the time constraints require this. Um, but let's take a step back um, and, and think about the message um, that we should take away from thinking about all these different features and, and the varying level of support for them across different circuit languages. 
Um, I think first and foremost, um, the most important thing to, to take away from this is that the space is still evolving. There are lots of different languages being developed. Um, and in some very real sense, we don't really know what all the best design choices are yet. So we really need to continue to explore. And, and people are, are very actively exploring right now, people in this call. Um, at the same time, the problem that each of these compilers is solving is extremely challenging. Um, so I, up here, I have a visualization of kind of the algorithm that you need to efficiently check memory accesses inside a circuit, which is shown on the right. It's called it's called a permutation network. This is an example of a Waxman network. Um, and, and these algorithms are, are sometimes pretty complicated. Uh, churning programming languages, which have state um, in various forms, in the form of memory, in the form of control flow, et cetera, into circuits which don't have any state at all is it's, it's a non-trivial transformation um, and, and the languages that are enabling this are working really hard um, and so um, and, and this is where i do a little bit of of um, a promotion of a cause that i care about um, i i think that one thing that we should seek to do as we continue to explore and, and tackle the challenging programs associated um, with compiling programs to circuits is we should try to share infrastructure as much as we can. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I would ask the question um, in the same way that LLVM, which is shown in the lower right, allows us to take various high level programming languages and compile them um, to different kinds of assembly formats in a way that, that makes it easier to add new languages and new assembly formats. I might wonder whether it's possible for us to build a similar compiler infrastructure for circuits that makes it easy to compile new high level languages to new circuit representations um, in a fashion that makes this easier for, for a given high level language and for a given circuit format. Um, and, and I've been thinking a little bit about this. We've been working on, on something in this direction called Circe. Uh, you, can, you can find more information about it. Um, at the links that are shown here. And that, that brings me to the end of, of my spiel, my taxonomy of circuit languages. Uh, I hope that you found it interesting. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and, and I'm excited that after this, we're gonna have talks from the language designers themselves who are really the authorities on, on their individual languages. Hey, very cool. So Alex, I don't know if you can see any of the uh, comments in the chat, but there was actually quite a lot Quite, quite a bit oh, of conversation awesome. happening. Um, I know that there, I think there was a few corrections that maybe you want to peek into and see if, if you could add those. Also, yeah, wanna, yeah, for sure. I want to introduce, I want to ask folks here um, if there are any further questions or anything else that you want Alex to talk about. Yeah, just put it in the group, put it in the chat. Um, I do, there's one question maybe to ask right off the bat though. So I think you would put, Going back to the very beginning, Alex was asking, was, wasn't was Pinocchio used in the first version of Zcash? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm oh. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I think the answer there was Zcash is written with LibSnark's gadget lib1. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, but that, so that, that, that's a statement about how they express the circuit. And then, so I think of, oh, I see, it's Pinocchio. Okay, great. Yeah, so Pinocchio, the compiler, was certainly not used for Zcash. Um, okay. It's possible that the proof system that Pinocchio built on was, uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, my impression was the answer is no, but, but I like everyone. This is actually a question about your slides. The, the colors that you used for the different languages, does that mean anything? Uh, it, so um, it doesn't. So so early on, there was sort of like a clustering effect, like various things were often close to each other. And I, okay. I tried to sort of choose the color, you know, like for coloring a map, I wanted to, to sort of for color the circuit languages. But um, but after that, it doesn't mean anything. OK. Um, Zocrity supports if else, but the condition must be fixed at compile time. Um, I don't believe it supports it for, for the statements, but Zocrates does support if else uh, expressions um, with, with sort of data dependent tests. Uh, but that's not the same thing because expressions don't have side effects. Um, although that's yet another like sort of feature. So sort of like ternary expressions um, is something that, that various languages have. Cool. All right, here's a question. Do you think R1CS, Plonk, Air, share enough trade-offs and properties so that they can effectively share the infrastructure? Uh, yes, I, I think that the answer is yes. Um, so obviously, like as things as the, the backends become more heterogeneous, the amount of infrastructure that you can share decreases, but that doesn't mean that it's it's not worth sharing what you can. Um, so in particular, like R1CS and Plonk have pretty similar opinions on how you express sort of most basic math, um, at, in, my, in, in my understanding. Um, and uh, at least I'm 
I'm sort of looking into to operating on that belief and, and trying to support Plonk and sort of the same infrastructure that targets R1CS. Cool.